الرجيم قال إني لعملكم من القالين رب نجني وأهلي مما يعملون فنجيناه وأهله أجمعين إلا عجوزا في الغابرين ثم دمرنا الآخرين وأمطرنا عليهم مطرا فساء مطر المنذرين إن في ذلك لآية وما كان أكثرهم مؤمنين وإن ربك لهو العزيز الرحيم صدق الله العظيم The people of Lut denied the messengers of Allah. When their brother Lut said to them, Do you not fear Allah? I am indeed a faithful messenger to you. So keep your duty to Allah and obey me. And I ask of you no return for it. My wage is only with the Lord of the worlds. Do you fornicate with males from among mankind and leave the wives your Lord created for you? Most certainly you are transgressors. They replied, O Lut, desist, or you will be banished. He said, I am of those who strongly detest your conduct. My Lord, save me and my household from what they do. So he saved him and his household, everyone, save an old woman who was among those who stayed behind. Thereafter, we destroyed the others, and we rained on them a rain, and dreadful was the rain which fell on them, on those who had been warned. Surely... There is a sign in this, but most of them are not believers. Truly, your Lord is the mighty, the merciful. <coughs> so brothers, uh, inshallah, the brother giving the talk today is a well-known brother in the Muslim community. He's a dawah and a regular speaker around the UK. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna start, ask him to start, inshallah. His name is Brother Mazhar. Inshallah, Brother Mazhar. <coughs> So if you have Facebook, this is uh, being live uh, live streamed, inshallah. Muhammad Ismail. Muhammad Ismail. Abdul Manaf. Abdul Manaf. The falsity of LGBT. Now, all of you are obviously aware of SRE, RSC, whichever acronym you want to use, and about the vote which took place in the parliament just a few days ago to legitimize and the words I would use is the indoctrination of LGBT propaganda to your children and people are having all sorts of debates about <clears throat> LGBT or a community they have rights um, we live in a secular society everybody should respect everybody else and so on and so forth I'm going to address this issue from a slightly different perspective and this is the crux of the matter. And the crux of the matter is addressing LGBT. Because this, my friends, is not an issue of ikhtilaf. This is an issue of aqidah now. Because they are trying to normalize and legitimize something amongst the Muslim community, regardless of which background you come from, that everybody accepts it is haram. And to normalize this is not a small thing. It's not a small thing. So we need to have the confidence with Iman and Yaqeen to know with full Yaqeen that the position Islam has is correct. And the way you're going to achieve that is by understanding their claims, their assertions and being to understand and know that they are fake. And this is what I'm going to present to you today, inshallah. <coughs> now, the contents, I'm going to first of all is briefly describe the issue at hand. Um, then I'm going to go through the arguments that they present, refute them, and hopefully give you an understanding why only, and people might feel shy at saying this, but as Muslims we should have full confidence that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who can define right and wrong. 
And we should have confidence to say that. We shouldn't be shy about that. And inshallah, I will demonstrate that to you. But also, to understand that LGBT is not some kind of a deviation that we think, alhamdulillah, Western society is very good. We live in a you know, very liberal society. Everybody's respected. You need to understand that LGBT values emanate directly from the Western creed of their philosophy of secularism. Or the more specific term, if you want to use, is hedonistic utilitarianism. If you study Western philosophy, this is directly from that creed. So we'll, we'll touch on that briefly, inshallah. So what's the issue at hand? I'll just touch on this briefly because I'm sure over the past few weeks you're well aware of what's going on. Um, for a good many years, the schools have been promoting this, right? Alhamdulillah, my daughters only went to Islamic school from the very first day to the very last day of their schooling. They've left school now. They only went to Islamic schools. Even in the Islamic schools, they address this. And a lot of parents don't know that. A lot of parents don't know that, that even in the Islamic schools, they are presenting this stuff. Now, the point is, you might think, oh, we're just ticking boxes for Ofsted rating. No, because the kids, when people of authority, ulama, ustads, when they talk about this, in the minds of the children, they think it's not a big issue because the ulama are talking about it. It must be okay. It must be okay. It's not such a big deal. It is a big deal. It is a big deal. So, homophobia and Islamophobia is being conflated. One of the arguments, I'm going to touch on that in a second, is they are saying, look, you Muslims are being discriminated against. You are being called extremists and terrorists. Homosexuals are being discriminated against. So we should work together. You support us and we'll support you. And only this morning I was having a debate with Muslims. And they were saying, yes, we have to do this, my friend. No, we don't. We don't. And I'm going to touch on that point as well. And people feel embarrassed. Liberal homosexuals are supporting Muslims. So why should we not support them? Well, if they're supporting us in a good cause, alhamdulillah, that doesn't mean you have to support them in something which is wrong. So we'll address that as well, inshallah. <clears throat> now, first and foremost, this conflation between Islamophobia and homophobia, right? There has been a concerted campaign by LGBT proponents, activists, supporters to go directly to the Muslim communities and ask them to support their cause. So I've got some pictures there. This is outside uh, East London Masjid in Whitechapel where those boys that are standing there, they are from Muslim families who are gays. They have now got the confidence to come out openly and say we are Muslim and we are gay. And they have got no shame in saying that. That's how much the atmosphere has changed. You know, when I was young, nobody talked about this stuff. It was like, it's, it's just wrong. But if you saw somebody walking with their girlfriend, and if they saw a Muslim, they would hide. Because they were ashamed of that. Now, within one generation, we've got gay people being proud to be gay. So don't think this is not going to affect you. You've got Muslim politicians supporting LGBT campaign. And if, I'm sure you're all aware, a vote took place on Thursday in the parliament. Every single Muslim MP, without exception, voted in favor. So, you know, we are told we should support Muslim politicians and we should take part in the system. It doesn't help you. That's another topic for another day. But just know that even those people who are supposed to be protecting our values and our cultures... They are promoting this stuff. Which is why it's very important that every single Muslim, ordinary, common man, like me and like you, we understand this issue and we stand up for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if our leaders and if people in positions of authority have abandoned the cause of Islam, it becomes more important that we uphold what is right and wrong. This chap, used to go on a campaign calling Muslim Nazis. Right? You'll see pictures of him on the internet saying Muslims are Nazis, they want to kill homosexuals. Now, he wants to be your friend.
Maybe you can't hear that. Let me just uh, say to you what they're saying. They're basically campaigning outside the masjid and telling the Muslims, you are being persecuted, we are being persecuted, let's join hands. Islam is not against homosexuality. <coughs> yeah, I don't know which tafsir they've read, the root surah about Lut salam in the Quran. But they are now saying that Islam is not against homosexuality. Islam is about peace and love. So you should be peaceful and loving to everybody. <coughs> this is a chap who came on TV on the Big Question program on Sunday morning. Pakistani, he's from South London. Um, I went to give a lecture at uh, Sheikh Suleiman Ghali's Masjid in Perli. And he lives in that community. He's, he's from that community down there. And the people in the masjid told me, he goes, three Muslim families have now got gay people as their children. And he comes on national TV. He goes, I am gay. I'm proud to be gay. My family can accept me. Why can't you accept me? So it's come to this stage where Muslims are not even shy to come on national television to proclaim that I'm gay and I'm proud of it. I apologize, you can't hear it because the volume's down. But that's the essence of what he's saying. So with the, they haven't even got the shame anymore. And the Prophet wasallam said, if you don't have shame, do as you wish. If you don't have haya, you can do as you wish because you're not bothered. Even that has been lost with some of these people. And as you know, they're promoting all sorts of books in the schools to normalize uh, same-sex relationship, to normalize homosexuality, and to normalize even transgender. You might, might have even seen that they are sending to schools, to children of the young age of five, six-year-old kids, um, they're sending transvestites, drag queens, men dressed as women, prancing about on stage, telling them, you can wear what you like. You can wear what you like. And a child is not able to distinguish. It needs to be told what is right and wrong. And when you tell a child, this is right and this is wrong, they take it without trying to intellectualize it because kids don't have that ability. It's only when they get mature they are able to think about it. So if you're telling a four or five year old that this is okay, they will accept it. And this is exactly what they're doing. Again, you won't be able to hear the audio on this clip, but this is a BBC report where they've got young children, as you can see, and they're telling the children to write a letter, a love letter from one man to another man, from one prince to another prince, to say why it's a good idea we should get married. So they are playing with the Iman and the minds of young kids. You know, this is, this is child abuse. This is child abuse. And they are doing this, and they are doing it with pride. And even the teacher at the end of the clip, she goes, it's so good. Because if we address this now, and we tell the children at five, six year old, that homosexuality is okay, when they grow up, it won't be a problem. So the question is now, that's just a very brief introduction of the impact it's having on you. And even now, many Muslim things are, oh, this is kuffar, this is their stuff, we, we don't believe in that, right? Please don't think that. Because what goes around in society will affect you. It will affect you, and I'm going to touch on that later on. But the point is now, how do we address this? And this is really important, how we address this. Because as a Muslim, our kalima, teaches us a very important lesson. When we say La ilaha illallah, that kalima teaches you a lesson. Not only is it an affirmation of faith that we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, none, none is worthy of worship except Allah. Yes, it teaches us that, but it teaches us a lesson. The kalima says there is none worthy of worship except Allah. So there's a refutation by an affirmation. Meaning if you believe in anything other than Allah, we are telling you it's not worthy of worship. So you need to demonstrate that whatever you believe in which is wrong, is wrong. Then you tell them what is right. And if you look at the Qur'an, if you read the story of the Anbiya, if you read the, 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 the stories of the previous Prophets, time and time again you find the Prophets coming to their communities and challenging what they believe in. And refuting what they believe in and then giving them their Pegam, their message. And there's, a, there's ayah there. Again, you're not going to be able to hear this.
at the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the king at that time claimed, I am like God. So Ibrahim alayhi salam didn't just say to him, no, Allah is God, you're not God. Ibrahim alayhi salam challenged him and refuted his claim. He goes, so he claimed to be God. So he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings the sun from the east. You bring it from the west. In front of everybody. Allah brings the sun from the east. You bring it from the west. If you claim to be God, bring it from the west. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, he was dumbfounded. He was dumbfounded because how can you refute that? So Ibrahim alayhi salam publicly demonstrated he claims to be God. I'm telling you he's not God because he can't even do this. So as a Muslim, we need to refute the claims people make. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, so many examples there are in the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. When the Quraysh would claim something, Rasulullah would refute it sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He would refute it. He wouldn't just say, no, that's wrong. He would refute it. So for example, with the, the daughters, when they would have daughters, they would bury them. So Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam would go to the Quraysh and say to them that when you have daughters, your face is turned dark with shame. And you bury them. But yet you make idols with your hands. And you claim that they are the daughters of Allah. Contradiction. So how is it that your God can have daughters but you can't have daughters? Contradiction. Refutation. Challenge. And this is the example of the prophets. This and this is the, the, the sunnah of the Quran. The methodology of the Quran. Of refuting and presenting the haqq. We need to do that. We need to follow that methodology. So when people claim that LGBT is right, we need to challenge it. We need to refute it. We need to explain why it's wrong and then shall tell them what is right. Because if Islam didn't just come for the believers, it came for everybody. Um, it is our right, it is our duty to explain a characteristic of the Muslims. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the Quran time and time again. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will repeat it in the verses that you believe in Allah. You give zakat, you pray salah, and enjoy the good, forbid the evil. Amar bil ma'ruf wa nahi anil munkar. Meaning it carries a similar importance of praying and fasting and believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that verily if you don't enjoy the good and forbid the evil, Allah will send calamity upon calamity and you will raise your hands in dua and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not answer your duas. So it is critical that when there is something going wrong, you need to raise your voice. And that's all we're saying. Raise your voice and address what is wrong. So how do we do this? And what are the claims that they make? So this is what I'm going to refute to you today. Now those people who support LGBT, they make a number of claims. I'm going to address four or five claims. One claim they make is that LGBT people are a community like Jews, like black people, black people, like Muslims. They all have rights. We need rights. It's only fair. If you have a right to practice your life, we gay people have a right to practice our life. We're not stopping you from being Muslim, so why are you stopping us from being gay? How do we address that? We'll talk about that in a second. Another claim they make is being gay is natural. It's normal. What's your problem? And they'll give you examples of animals being gay. They say if animals are gay, it means it's natural. So why do you religious people object? We'll address that. They say it's about freedom. If two adults are consenting and they want to have a relationship and they're not harming anybody else, what's your problem? Nobody's telling you to do it. We'll address that. And they say people are born gay. So I didn't choose to be gay. I was born that way, so why do you criticize me for being that way? And these are the four prominent points that they make. And each one of them are fake and false. And that's what I'm going to address now with you. And honestly, my brothers and sisters, this is the crux of the matter, this one argument about minority rights. Saying that we are one community, you are one community, and we should support one another. So they say liberal values determine right and wrong. So if you accept this argument that you're one community and we are one community, 
you are actually accepting and consenting to something else which has not been said. And that is that liberalism has the right to define what is right and wrong. And we don't accept that. We don't accept that. So for example, if you accept everybody has the right to do what they want, you will have to accept that if your daughter comes home and says, I don't want to pray, I don't want to wear hijab, it's my right, you can't tell me what to do. You'd have to accept that. You have to accept that believing in Tawheed and believing in Shirk is equal. Now, of course, you can't force anybody to believe what you believe in, but you can at least say that, no, we think that is wrong and this is right. But if you accept this basis of argument, you are forfeiting your right to tell people what is right and wrong. And in fact, you are, you are terminating the whole concept of da'wah. You're terminating the concept of amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar. Because if everybody has a right to do whatever, nobody has a right to tell them what to do. So if you believe in liberal secular values as the criteria to define what is, what is right and wrong, you are saying to yourselves and to everybody else that nobody can tell somebody else what to do. This is absolutely not acceptable to a Muslim because we have to tell everybody, to Muslims and to non-Muslims, and give them the message of Islam that what you are doing is wrong, this is right. If they listen to you or they don't listen to you, that's not in your hands. That's not in your hands. But it is in your hands to, dem to, to proclaim what is right and advise people and to give them advice and enjoin upon them what is good and to forbid them from doing bad. Whether they listen to you or not, that's none of your, uh, it's not within your ability to do that. But you have to speak about it. And it's a dangerous game because once you do that, what happens is, as a Muslim community, you now become, you have opened the doors for attack. You have opened the doors for attack on yourself. And it'll be only a generation or two before your Islam will be finished. So we don't accept the right that all communities have equal rights. If the government gives it, that's fine. But we as Muslims believe that only that is right which Allah says is right and that is wrong which Allah says is wrong. Right? Maybe we can discuss that in Q&A because this is a, is a big subject in itself. The other claim, they say animals are gay. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because this is just nonsense. Right? First and foremost, animals are not gay. Right? But, let's concede on that point. Let's say animals are gay. Because even the examples they give you, they're not really true examples, right? And there's a lot of d dispute about that. But for the sake of the argument, let's say animals are gay. So what does that mean? Does it mean it's natural? No, it doesn't. Because animals, if you've got a cat at home, the cat licks itself clean. That's natural for a cat. Is it natural for me? No, it's not. Some animals eat their excrement like pigs and rabbits. It's natural for them to eat the excrement. Is it natural for me to do that? No, it's not. Some animals kill their young, like a lion. If a lion wants to mate with a lioness and the lioness has cubs, she won't mate. So what the lion does, it kills the cubs. So then the, the lioness comes back into uh, a season. So he will mate. Now, lions do that. It's natural for lions to kill their own cubs. Is it natural for us to kill our cubs? No. So if an animal is gay, how does it make it natural for me? And those people who claim is gay, do they lick themselves clean? Do they eat their own excrement? Do they kill little children? No, they don't. So why are you picking on this natural thing and not all the other stuff? And what is natural for one animal is not natural for another animal. It is natural for a monkey to pick the lice of another monkey and eat it. I don't see gay people doing that. What is natural for one animal is not natural for another animal. So if a monkey picks lice, a fish doesn't do that. A, fi a fish swims in the water, a monkey doesn't swim in the water. What is natural for one animal is not natural for another animal. So how can you extrapolate that what is natural for an animal is natural for a human being? So this is not a proof. You've not proven anything. Yeah. First of all, we don't even accept animals are gay. But even if they were gay, it doesn't prove anything. Is that point clear to you, my friends? <coughs> yeah.
they say if two people are consenting, what's your problem? They're not forcing you to do anything. And what they're trying to imply is because two people are consenting over something, you can't tell them what to do. You know, even under British law, even under the Sharia, but leave Sharia to one side, even under British law, consent doesn't legitimize the action of two people. I'll give you an example. You know, last year, BT merged with EE. BT, telecoms, merged with EE, telecoms. They both consented to merge. Under British law, were they allowed to merge? No, they weren't. The Monopolies and Mergers Commission has to check what harm is this going to cause to society. So consent alone doesn't make it legal. If a brother wants to get married to a sister, both adults, say they're both 20 years old, a brother wants to get married to a sister, both adults, both consenting. Under British law, it's not accepted because it's incest. So if consent is your proof for LGBT, why is it not proof for incest? Even under British law, if companies want to merge, consent alone is not sufficient to make it legitimate. If a 40-year-old woman wants to get married to a 20-year-old man, but that man happens to be her son, and they both consent, and they're both adults, it's still illegal. It's still illegal. So when you say consent is a proof, it's not a proof. Because the act, what they're doing, doesn't legitimize that. That act needs to be proven on its own merits, whether it's right or wrong. So just saying they've consented. If two, For example, if two people consent to kill one another, does it make it right? No, it doesn't. You know, you've got euthanasia taking place now where older people are going off to uh, Switzerland to kill themselves. People consent to having themselves killed by somebody else. Just because they consent, they have to go to Switzerland. Why? Because in Britain it's illegal. So consent alone doesn't legitimize something. I hope that point's clear with you. Following on from this argument of freedom, they say, look, if some people do something, what's your problem? It doesn't affect you. Two people are doing it. It doesn't affect you. What's your problem? You know, my friends, this is a bogus argument. Because even in Islam, we accept if something, some people are doing something private, it's nobody's business. You can't spy on Muslims. You can't even spy on non-Muslims, yeah? You can't spy on people. And we know the story of Umar al-Farooq radiallahu anh, when he was a Khalifa in Medina, and he found one man having a party in his house, and he jumped over the wall, and he went into the house. You know, we hear this many times in the bayans, in the masajid. And that man said, I made one mistake, you made three mistakes. You were spying on me. You entered my house without permission and you came through the back door. And Umar radiallahu anh left. So we don't spy on people. But this is not about something which is private. We're not talking about somebody doing something private. When the government is teaching your kids about LGBT in school, it's not private, it's public. When the government is pudging, passing legislation in the parliament to normalize LGBT, it's not private, it's public. When they are using courses at workplaces to normalize LGBT, it's not private, it's public. And when in the general culture of society, in their, in their culture, in their films, in their stories, in their novels, they are talking about this and normalizing it, it is not private, it's public. And what is public will affect the whole of society. And how does this affect? It will affect you. For example, every Western society, their birth rate is either, either flatlining or declining. Hence, migration to these lands. Because they don't have enough people to work. And when you don't have a birth growth, uh, 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 an increase in population, a birth rate, what happens is you have more older people than younger people. So you have more older people that need care. So what does the government do? They increase taxes. Now they are asking old people to sell their homes so they can pay for their old age care. So this is the result of secular values of freedom that I don't want to get married. I want to do what I want to do. I want to be gay. I don't want to be married. I just want to have a girlfriend. I don't want to have children. 
LGBT is just one value, but there's many other secular values which affect society. So they even affect you because your taxes go up. You will be forced to sell your houses. And so on and so forth. So you can't say that two people doing something doesn't affect me. Because it's not about two people doing something. It's about values which have been promoted throughout society. And in every Western society, you find that the population is static or declining. Hence, immigration into these countries. And also the fact that when you destroy the family unit, the Jews, the Christians, the Muslims, and over millennia, the social structure has been agreed upon about father, mother, children, a family unit, grandparents, uncle and aunties having responsibility for one another. And this is how societies looked after one another. When you break that structure down, and now the state has the right to bring your kids up. And the state has the right to take your children away from you and put them in foster care. You are destroying the very fabric of society. And the psychological impact you have now, you won't know until two or three generations later. So you don't even know the effect you are going to have with your policies on society. That, itself, that in itself is a subject maybe for another, another discussion. And Islam tells us that if something is going to affect society, you have to forbid it. Because if you don't, it will affect you. And this hadith of Nu'man bin Bashir radiallahu an, when he likens society to a boat, people on the top deck and people on the lower deck. And if the people on the lower deck want water, they ask the people on the top deck to throw a bucket over, get the water, pass it down. Now if somebody on the lower deck has a good idea, or oh, let me just make a hole in the boat and get some water. If the people on the top deck don't stop him, the whole boat will sink. So if as Muslims we don't challenge these ideas and these become normal in society, all of, us, all of us will be affected by these values. You can't restrict this. This is public. This is public. Now this last point they say is we were born that way. First and foremost, there is no scientific consensus to say gay people are born gay. Now you think, oh, you've chosen your words very carefully there by saying consensus. Yes. Because when you have a consensus, it's a fact. So you have a biological consensus that a person is a man or a woman because of chromosomes. There's XX and there's XY chromosomes. So there is a consensus that one defines a man, the other defines a woman. <laughs> so what is the DNA? What is the biological uh, 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 pattern in a, in a person to say they are gay, nobody knows. So there's no consensus. Yes, there's conjecture, there's theories, but there's no fact. So you cannot say somebody is born gay because there's no biological proof. Now the other thing on top of that is, let's say for argument's sake, there is a gene that says you're gay. Let's just say that for argument's sake. Does it make it right? It still doesn't make it right. Why? Because your biology doesn't determine for you your values. For example, let me give you an example. Let's say a lady is pregnant and the fetus carries the DNA of a life-threatening disease. So a woman is pregnant, she's got a fetus and through tests they find out they've got a D the baby's got a DNA which is going to cause them severe handicap. That's the science, you accept. That's the science. That's the proof. Now, when they make a decision to abort the fetus, did the science tell you to do that? Or did your values tell you to do that? Science didn't tell you to abort it. The biology didn't tell you to abort it. The DNA didn't tell you to abort it. Your values told you to abort it. So don't blame science for your values. Don't hide behind science. Don't hide behind nature. You're making that decision because of the values that you have. And this is no different. Do you remember Hitler? Hitler wanted to kill non-Aryan people. Because Hitler says, science has shown that the white people are superior to non-white people. They call this in science eugenics. Eugenics. So Hitler used science to kill other people. 
And the colonialists, before they went to colonize India and Africa and Asia, because they used the science of evolution to say that we are more evolved, more civilized than the dark people. So they use science. So the colonialists use science to colonize people. Hitler used science to kill people. And now they want to use, claim to use science to make everybody gay. It doesn't work that way, my friend. You can't hide behind science. Science didn't tell the colonialists to go and kill people in India and Africa. Science didn't tell Hitler to kill people. Your values told you that. Your racist values told you that. Your ideology told you to do that, not science. And if you say gays are born that way, what about people who are incestuous? What about people who are pedophiles? What about people who are zoophiles? Zoophiles are people who want to have relationship with animals. Why are they not born that way? Why is it just this one category is born that way? What about thieves and murderers and rapists? Why are they not born that way? Why is just this one category of people born that way? There's no science for that. So that goes to show you the bogus arguments that they put forward. And they can't answer that question. Why is a homosexual born homosexual, but not an incest person, not a bestiality, not a, not a pedophile, not anybody else? <coughs> At this point they're saying that, but now if you go to the universities, they're debating that, you know what? Pedophiles are born that way as well. Yes, but it, huh? It's on the way. It's on the way, but it's... Because, of evolution. <laughs> because it's, it's not from the science, it's from their ideas. Yeah. It's from their philosophy. And we'll touch on that in, in a point, in, in a minute, inshallah. So this is the point now. This thing about incest, and, well, leave incest for now, but LGBT homosexuality, it comes from their creed. It's not like a deviation. Okay, no, no, West is generally okay. They're quite normal, rational ideas. No. All of the ideas of liberalism, freedom, evolution, secularism, all of them emanate from their philosophy. All of them. And homosexuality also emanates from that. And I'll tell you how. In Western philosophy, whichever strand of Western philosophy you look at, right? And all the Western philosophers that existed, you know, in the 18th century, in the 17th century, and even in the 19th century. What was the argument they were looking at? The argument was this. They said religion has caused a lot of problem in Europe because the Christians were always fighting the Protestants and the Catholic. And that's why they hate religion. Because their religion always was fighting, fighting. So they think all religions are like that. No, your religion was like that. Catholics and, Ro uh, Catholics and Protestants killed one another and they had wars between different countries. So the philosopher says, how do we get rid of religion? How can we live without going to religion? This was the argument they were looking at. And all the different philosophers had their different take on it. But all of them had a consensus on something. What can we refer to? And they said, our aql. If it agrees with us that we like it, we will do it. And the other point was, if it gives us benefit, if it gives us benefit, we will do it. So this became the crux of Western philosophy and all the different philosophies that came off that. That... If you like it, and if it benefits you, it's got to be good. And the specific term for that is hedonistic utilitarianism. That something you enjoy and gives you a benefit, it cannot be wrong. So we don't need God. We can work things out for ourselves. This is the crux of the matter. So their argument is if you do something and you find pleasure in it, and you're not harming anybody else, what's wrong with it? And that's where this stuff comes from. Now, this is not new. Some of you will know that <clears throat> organizations like Nambla and Pi have existed for decades. Anybody heard of Pi? Pi? Well, some of you know, but Pi was a legitimate organization existed in Britain in the 70s. And it stands for Pedophile Information Exchange. And their objective was to legalize pedophilia. And they wrote a paper to lower the age of consent. At that time it was 18 or something, down to 10. And their aim was to abolish it completely. So a 4-year-old and a 5-year-old could have a relationship with a 55-year-old. And don't think these are like nutters and fringe element people. 
two barristers signed this press document or press release or whatever it was, this legal document that they came out with. Two barristers, and you know what their names were? One was Harriet Harman, Labour politician, barrister, and the other was Patricia Hewitt, barrister, Labour politician. This was in the 70s, trying to legalise paedophilia. And even the government gave them a £30,000 loan for their activities. It came in the news this week. If you, if you read the Guardian newspaper, this week they discovered when they were looking onto these paedophilia things in the parliament and all these crimes with um, the politicians, they came across these papers to say that the government actually funded this organisation as well. So don't think that this is a deviation. It emanates from their aqidah of freedom. The aqidah of liberalism. The aqidah of we can do whatever we like to do if it benefits us or if we enjoy it. And you know, in some Euro you, we, we think, oh, stop for a lot, this is bad. In some northern European countries like Denmark, humans having a relationship with animals is not illegal. If you know anybody from Denmark, ask them. If you know anybody from Denmark, ask them that can a human have a relationship with an animal? They've got places where men can go to visit animals. They exist, my friends. They exist. In some of the northern European countries, incest is not illegal. Because they say, two adults consenting, not causing anybody harm, what's your problem? And if we keep quiet, this will be all normalized. And other than the Muslim, there's nobody else left to stand up to speak about what is right and wrong. And if we as a community keep quiet, then you know, we are not just harming the society, we are harming our Akhirah. Now the other aspect of Western philosophy is you can use your Aqal. You know, if you use your Aqal, you can legalize everything. And if you use your aql, you can make everything illegal as well. Because you don't know where the khair is. You don't know where the shar is, you don't know where the khair is. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that. So for example, if you use your aql, you can legalize anything you want. So, sorry. So they say, why, why is it wrong to have a relationship with animals? They say, oh, because animals can't consent. Animals can't consent. Okay? If you ask them, which is a bigger crime, murder or rape? And if you survey all the legal codes around the world, in every jurisdiction, you get a severe, more severe sentence for murder than you get for rape. Which means they consider murder a bigger crime than rape. Yeah? So, when you murder an animal to make a beef burger, do you ask for its consent? So if you can murder an animal and not get its consent, why do you need to have its consent if you want to do nikah with a, chi uh, with a cow? So if you use your uncle, there's your legal, legal argument. But as an adult, do you ask for your child's consent to tell them to do their homework? No, you don't. Do you ask for their consent to go to bed? No, you don't. Do you ask for their consent to go to madrasa or school? No, you don't. Do you ask for their consent to clean up in the house or do some chores in the house? No, you don't. You tell them. Why? Because you tell them to do things which are best for them, for their development. So if you as a parent think it's in their de de development to have relationship with older people, why not? And this is the argument pedophiles will use. So I've gone through now some of the arguments and refuted them. You can't refer to nature. Nature doesn't tell you what is halal and haram. You can't refer to science. Science doesn't tell you what is halal and haram. You can't refer to your hawa, your desires. It doesn't tell you what's halal and haram. You can't refer to your aql because your aql doesn't know what is halal and haram. When you explain that, you realize that you know what? We need divine guidance. How else are you going to know what is halal and haram? There is no way you can work it out. There is no way you can work it out. For example, like coming back to the logical argument, you could say alcohol. 
I can give you arguments on both sides to say it should be legal or illegal. I could say it should be illegal, why? Because it causes a lot of harm, a lot of health problems. Yeah, agreed. It causes violence. Yeah, agreed. Causes divorce. Yeah, agreed. Causes ma marital breakdown and extramarital relationships. Yeah, I agreed. It causes a lot of harm. Yes. It causes something like extra six billion dollars to the NHS to treat alcohol related illnesses. So you think, oh, that's a strong argument to ban it. Yeah, it should be banned. Now I can give you another argument to say, no, you can't ban it. How? Alcohol is so widespread in this society. So much alcohol is drunk that the amount of tax collected goes into the billions. If you ban alcohol and billions of tax is now not collected, how are you going to run the hospital? How are you going to run the police? How are you going to run the infrastructure? How are you going to pay the benefits? How are you going to have sporting events? Most of the sporting events are sponsored by drinks companies. Lots of people are going to lose their jobs. The clubs are going to close down. Breweries are going to close down. Thousands of people are going to be unemployed. How are you going to pay their benefits? You think, oh yeah, I can't do that. So you see the dilemma you have. You don't know where the khair and shar is. Only Allah knows that. It's like the Quraysh at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One of the concerns the Quraysh had is this man believes in Tawheed. If we agree with him, we've got 364 idols in the Kaaba. And all the tribes all over Arabia come to Mecca. If we get rid of all the idols and we just have Allah to worship, who's going to come to Mecca? Nobody's going to come to Mecca. We're going to lose our trade. We're going to lose our businesses. We're going to lose our prestige. So according to the Akal, you think, no, we can't accept this Islam. Because our business will be destroyed. We're in the middle of the desert. We need money to survive. But when Rasulullah liberated Mecca and destroyed the idols and established Tawheed, more people came to Mecca than ever before, to this day. Your aql could not have predicted that. It's counterintuitive because only Allah knows where the khair is. So sometimes Allah will ask you to do something which you think doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't make any sense because you don't have the ability to understand that. But Allah knows the khair in that thing. And that's what we have our iman in. And that's why nature is not a guide. Science is not a guide. Aql is not a guide. Logic is not a guide. So how do we know what is right and wrong? There's only one thing left for you now. That is Allah giving you guidance from the heavens and sending you a messenger with a book. That's the only way you're going to know what is right and wrong. And Allah says in the Quran, Have you seen those people who take their desires as God? And now we are talking about those people who believe in freedom. I will do what I want to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Have you seen those people who take their desires as God? Because your desires, if you follow your desires, you have, they have taken the job of, they have taken the role of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one to tell you what to do and not to do. You are the slave to Allah, not to your desires. So Allah is telling you, you have no way of knowing that. And Allah says in Surah Baqarah, shay'an. Maybe there is a thing that you think is bad for you, but it's good. And maybe there is a thing good for you, but you dislike it, Allah knows you know not. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is again making this point, you don't have the ability to know what is khair and shar, halal or haram. Can you get a tomato, cut it and put it under the microscope and say, oh, yep, it's halal? No. The thing doesn't tell you it's halal. If you do an action, the action doesn't tell you it's halal, the furqan tells you it's halal. Like if you get a knife and stab somebody, is that halal or haram? Well, if you go in the street and stab somebody, it's haram. But if you're in a, in a war, in a jihad, in a legitimate jihad, and your enemies come to fight you, and you, you put a knife in them, that is a, that's a good act. But the act is exactly the same. Getting a knife and sticking it in somebody. One is halal, one is haram. The act is exactly the same. But it's the furqan will tell you which is halal and which is haram. Otherwise, there's no way of knowing what is halal and haram. You need to have a furqan. You need to have a criterion. And this is what the Qur'an is. And this is what the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is. To tell you what is right and what is wrong. Without it, you are lost. <coughs> so we've gone through this argument that if you use your desires, you can justify anything based on your aql and logic. Yeah? We've gone through the argument that you can rationalize having relationship with animals. And 
I'm, I'm not going to go into this in details because this is a point in itself. We have only got five senses. We can see things, we can smell things, we can taste things, we can touch things, we can hear things. That's how we perceive the universe. But there are things that exist beyond that, but we don't have the, uh, the, the, the senses to perceive that. Maybe we are talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his deen now. Maybe there's malaika here today. We can't sense them. Because Allah has only given us five senses. And even with those senses, you can sense the reality, but the senses don't allow you to know what is halal and haram. It's not in the reality. You can't taste halal and haram. You can't hear halal and haram. You can't smell halal and haram. You can't see halal and haram. It's not in the thing. It's the furqan which decides that. And that is the basis for determining what is right and wrong. So what do we do? Why have I gone through this argument? I've not talked about SRE and the legislation and everything. We need to have yaqeen in Islam that Islam, what is told is, is absolutely correct. And we're not going to shift from that position. We're not going to water that position down. And people say, oh, you're homophobic. No. As a Muslim, I categorically say drinking alcohol is haram. Do you call me alcoholophobic? As a Muslim, I say having a relationship outside of marriage is haram. Sorry. I absolutely say that having a relationship outside of marriage is haram. Do you call me xenophobic? I don't eat pork. Does that make me pork phobic? So they use these languages and words to put you on the back foot. No, just because I disagree with something doesn't mean I'm going to be... Uh, I'm going to spread hatred against that person. I'm not asking you to go and kill him. I'm not telling you to go and abuse him. I'm just telling you it's wrong. I'm giving advice to that person because I want to help him. I don't want... Even the people, we don't want anybody to go to Jahannam. So I'm telling him it's wrong for his own good, not because I hate him. So if somebody's drinking alcohol... It, like in my office, I'll give you a story. In my office, uh, 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 a new person joined. And one of the guys who sits with me, we have this discussion. He goes, oh... You know Mazhar, he's a bit homophobic, he's Mazhar. So I said, oh, you've been a bit cheeky now, aren't you? And he's, he's just trying to create a bit of a problem. And the person who came, was a lady, I said to her, I talked about all this stuff. I said, I think it's wrong. And I gave her these examples. I said, just because I say it's wrong, doesn't mean I hate somebody. I said, this guy who told you I'm homophobic, I said, he lives at home with his girlfriend, he's got two kids, I've told him you're living in sin. I told him it's wrong. But I said, what's my professional relationship with you? He goes, yeah, you're right, you are. So I said, I can still have a, 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 you know, a dialogue with you and a discussion with you. I don't hate you, but I'm telling you what you're doing is wrong because I want you to be better. I want you to be better than what you are. I don't agree with people who drink, but everybody in the office drinks. I don't agree with people who eat pork. Most of the non-Muslims eat pork. So if that's not an issue, why is this an issue? Because they're trying to create a political climate where we can't discuss this. That's why. So don't be afraid of this. If they throw labels at you, homophobic and this phobic, he said, no, you can call me homophobic, you can call me pig phobic, you can call me alcoholic phobic, you can call me xenophobic. I'm going to tell you what's right and wrong. I'm going to tell you what's right and wrong. And all of this, my friends, recently they also said it, that Ofsted, when it monitors the schools, they're going to use the LGBT as a criteria to, note, to, to measure extremism. So when they come to the Muslim kids and they ask them, do you believe in LGBT? And if they say, oh, we think it's wrong, they will now put a, a mark next to them and think, oh, potential extremist. That's why we have to speak up against this. This is about the prevent agenda. You know, in 2005, after the attack in London, Tony Blair, when he was prime minister, he gave a speech in Tendani Street. And for the first time, he defined what is an extremist. He said, extremist is the one who believes that all the Muslims should have one Amirul Mu'mineen. Well, all Muslims believe in that. He said, Muslim is the one, sorry, an extremist is the one who believes that the state of Israel shouldn't exist. Most people believe that, even non-Muslims. He said, extremist is the one um, who believes in Sharia law is higher than man-made law. Or some words to that effect. Well, all Muslims believe that Allah has the right to determine halal and haram. And he mentioned one other point which I forget. But the fifth point was very interesting. 
One Ummah, yeah, if you believe you are one Ummah. Because you're not, you're British. Islam is just your religion. And the fifth one was, if you believe homosexuality is a sin, you're an extremist. What has that got to do with violence or terrorism? Nothing. So you should understand that this agenda and the prevent agenda is there to change your deen. It's not about violence. It's not about extremism. It's not about none of that stuff. That's what they use as the promotional merchandise. But what they want to do is to make your deen like Anglican Christianity, just a, a meaningless religion of rituals. And remember, they've done this before. When they occupied India and the ulama, especially from the Deoband, they stood up against the British Raj. They arrested them and put them in prison in Malta. They put them in prison in Malta. And they wanted to strip away from the Muslims two things. Because the, the Hazrat Maulana Nanotvi and Hazrat Maulana Gangohi, they led a jihad in 1857 against the British. So the British wanted to strip two things away from the Muslims. One was jihad and one was the Sharia. They said, just be like a religion like all the other religions. And they created that. And that was called Qadiani religion. Qadiani religion was Islam without the Sharia and jihad and all the other stuff. And that this Ghulam Mirza is the new man to believe in. Other than that, the Qadianis do everything we do. They pray five times a day. They grow beards. They do all the things we do. And this is what they're trying to do again now. They're trying to create British Islam, which is Qadiani 2.0. British Islam is Qadiani religion 2.0. Islam without all the other stuff they don't like. Yeah, you want to pray and fast in Ramadan? No problem. Do all of that stuff. But the values you take from us, not from your religion. So what we need to do is honestly, in our madrasas, in our masajids, we need to discuss these issues. So our children and our people in the community understand this. So when they face it in society, they are not affected by it. And they are able to guide non-Muslims. Because honestly, even the non-Muslims don't even know why this is right or wrong. If you ask them to debate, they'll just come up with mantra what they've heard on the media. If you probe them and ask them, said, okay, explain to me how. They haven't got a clue. They're just like parrots repeating what they've been told. We need to have a deeper understanding so we can give guidance to them. Protect our community and give guidance to them. And we need to be on the front foot. We shouldn't be legitimate. We shouldn't be on the defensive explaining, oh, we don't do this and we don't do this. No, we should be challenging them. The NBA did that. They challenged the, the, the people of their communities. <laughs> They challenged them, refuted them, accounted them. And that was the method of their da'wah. And we need to do the same thing. We shouldn't be hiding in the masajids and the madrasa and keeping quiet. We need to engage with the people. And I've been also going to many mad madrasas in Bradford and places like that and having a workshop with the kids, explaining to them about relationships. We need to do this in our madrasas. We need to add something to our curriculums. I know the time is very limited. You have one or two hours with the kids each evening, Monday to Friday. You don't have much time. But once a month, once a month on a Friday, close the kitabs and talk about some of these issues which are affecting the children in the schools. About drugs, about girlfriend, boyfriend, about LGBT stuff, about evolution. Even kids are now saying, oh, we don't know if there's a God or not. They should have full yaqeen in that. Give them the arguments. Give them the understanding so they can have yaqeen in it. This is not rocket science. This is easy to achieve this stuff. It's easy to achieve this. So we need to do that. And all these questions that the kid are being asked. You know, you'll be shocked what goes in their heads. When my daughter was eight, she's only gone to Islamic school. She's sitting in the car with me one day. She goes, Abaji, why do we have to pray? This wasn't your normal question about why do we need to pray? It was much deeper than that. She said to me, eight-year-old girl, she shouldn't be asking questions like this. She's saying to me, Abaji, why do we have to pray? Allah doesn't need our salah. Allah is above that. So why do I have to pray? I don't want to pray. It's not going to affect Allah whether I pray or not. Should an eight-year-old be asking questions like that? You know, I couldn't sleep that night. I was bechen. So why is my daughter asking that question? How do you explain difficult concepts to a child of eight? It's hard to do. 
Now, pray is for our benefit, not for Allah's benefit. It's for our benefit. <clears throat> but why? Some things you don't know and you can't understand. So I said to my daughter, next day, I thought about it. I had her in the car. And I said to her, I said, Bitta, um, if somebody's blind, how do you explain to them the color blue? And she's struggling. She goes, um, you tell him to look in the sky. I said, Bitta, you're blind. And she's getting agitated because she has to have the last word. And my son's sitting in the front seat. He's only about six at that time or five. Can't do it, can't do it, can't do it, can't do it. <laughs> you yeah, can, yeah, can. Nope, can't do it, can't do it. And she's getting frustrated because she can't give an answer. I said, Bitta, just like a blind person can't see color and there is no way through the sight, sorry, no way by hearing or by smell or by touching you can ever explain blue. Blue you can only see. I said there are many things that exist where Allah didn't give us a senses to perceive. You ne so some answers you're never going to be able to work out for yourself. You're never going to be able to work out for yourself. So when Allah tells you, you know Allah exists and you know the book is from Allah. And if Allah tells you something, you take it. Now for a child it's difficult to explain this concept. But the bigger question is, why is an eight-year-old child asking questions like this? Because the atmosphere we live in is ideological against Islam. <coughs> they want to take the Islam away from you. <laughs> Inshallah, if you want the slides for this, if you leave your email address or mobile number, I can WhatsApp you or I can email you the slides. And if you want other literature about this stuff, inshallah, whatever I've got, I can send it to you. But please, my appeal to you is don't belittle yourselves by thinking I'm just an ordinary guy. I'm an ordinary guy. But if people who are more educated than myself, with more knowledge than myself, if they are not doing what needs to be done, then honestly, we can't just sit back and say, well, nobody's doing it. I'm not going to do it. We need to educate ourselves. And we need to advise one another and help one another to speak up for this stuff. So we can't say that I'm not qualified. We need to take a stand and really go to your masajids, go to your madrasa, speak to the ulama and say, look, we need to organize programs to address these things in our mosques. Because there are people out there, I'm not going to mention names, who are trying to normalize this, even so-called quote-unquote ulama. In America, it's gone worse. You've got prominent da'is in America, well-known, I'm not going to mention their names, standing shoulder to shoulder with the gays and they said they have a right to do this. Because they don't understand what we've just discussed today. So this is a, it's a big issue. This is about creed. This is about aqidah. Distorting the perceptions of what is right and wrong. Wasallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. If you've got any questions or anything, maybe we've got five minutes or so to maybe... Quick. After salah, inshallah, those people who want... After salah, inshallah. But like I say, if you want the slides, what I've presented, then if you leave your email or number behind with the sheikh here, then inshallah I'll send them on to you. If you do have a few questions, I mean we, we can uh, we can deal with a few questions right now. Uh, but if you've got some more, then we can always deal with some after the Maghrib Salah as well, inshallah. Yes, brother. Uh, the question, brother, is uh, about uh, of this stuff. Uh, how do we sort of play with all this stuff is really great. I mean... But I understand that what's on the way is also to make this hate speech. If you just like how it is, if you say what Israel does, criticize you, you're anti-Semitic. So, so how do you do this without getting this? So now I understand in a few years it's going to become a law as well. To you'll be sort of liable to be <laughs> penal life for prosecuted for that. This kind of thing. Okay, so brothers, brother asking the question. Um, if we speak about this stuff, it can be labeled as hate speech and it can cause difficulties upon us. So how do we deal with that? No, I understand in a few years there's going to be a law about this as well. That yeah. Is hate speech. So. Yeah. They could pass a law. Yeah. You know, I spoke to many ulama in uh, Bolton, Manchester, uh, Preston. And one question that some of the ulama raised is a concern that they have. That if we speak about this stuff, what will happen to our madrasa? Will they close it down? Right? And I, speak, I explained to the Maulana that look, legally speaking, you can absolutely say that according to our beliefs, it's a sin. There's no law against that. 
right? If you're in a state school, it's a different issue, right? Because you've signed up to the state curriculum and stuff. That's a different issue. But from a madrasa and a masajid, from the mimbar, you can say this. But I said to the maulana, I said, let's say that you feel worried that you don't want to address this because it's going to cause difficulty. I said, you don't talk about khilafa. You don't talk about sharia. You don't talk about some of the Palestine. You don't talk about all of these issues. I said, if you're not going to talk about morality, what's left for you to talk about from the mimbar? And this is a concern that we shouldn't self-censorship because of fear. They are trying to generate fear out there. So people who are speaking against this, they're trying to create fear. So there's a Dr. Kate Godfrey. Now, the, her professional body is investigating her. She hasn't broken any laws. There's other people who are being bombarded. Myself, they wrote an article about me in the Times newspaper. They're trying to create fear. So we self-censorship. You know, there's no law against speaking about this. But if we keep quiet and cause self-censorship, we are going to cause more problems for ourselves because we are making it haram on ourselves. So really, don't self-censorship yourself. Have courage. You know, and speak up. Because all, you know... This is another topic in itself, but you know all the great ulama that everybody respects across the broad. Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, Imam Shafi'i, and many, many other ulama. All of them, if you read their stories, about their life stories, all of them clashed with the authorities of their time because they were causing some fasad. And they didn't stop speaking, they continued to speak. And that is the sunnah of great people, that they speak the haqq. Right? We're not talking about breaking the laws, we're not talking about violence, we're not talking about harming anybody. We're just talking about speaking the haq. So my appeal is don't be curtailed by fear. Because if you sense self-censorship, you're doing the job of the <coughs> government for them. If there are any questions from the sister side as well, please don't hesitate to ask. Yep, the mic. Solution to it. Do you have anything as such, brother? 
Sorry, brothers and sisters, there's a car, um, NC54 LFT, which is causing problems. That needs to be removed now, please. NC54 LFT, car blocking your path. Uh, and also, if there are any questions, uh, if there are any questions, uh, the mic is, there is a mic on both sides, the sister's side at the back and the brother's side at the back as well. So if you do have a question, there's a mic there as well. Please remove this car. Zakulahar. Just briefly, I think, brother, you know, the most effective and efficient way to address this stuff, um, you know, talking about homeschooling and stuff. Yeah, if you can homeschool, definitely homeschool, yeah? But the thing is, at the end of the day, you need to remember one thing. You as a parent are responsible for your children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put you responsible, not the ulama, not the teachers. So if, the, if they go to madrasa and they've, not, they've been failed and they've gone to school and they've been failed, you can't blame them because the responsibility is still with you. So you need to make sure, you need to check what's going on in those schools and stuff. Now, we've got two idaras in our control so far. The masajid and the, the madaris. Yeah? And the best, most effective way for us to protect our community is through our institutions, the madrasas and the masajids. So go back to your uh, communities, to your madrasa, to your masajid, and speak to the ulama, because ulama want to do this, they need help. I spoke to ulama and they said, yes, we want to do this, but we, we feel that we're not equipped to do this. Some, some of this stuff we're not able to uh, 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 discuss with. If you've got that, there's people like me, I'm more than happy to come and sit privately with the ulama. And explain to them what points they can discuss. And we've been doing that. We held a meeting in Rochdale. All the Rochdale council members got all the ulama together. We discussed with them. We went to Bolton. The Bolton council members got all the ulama together. We spoke with them. Went to Preston. All the ulama came together and we spoke to them. Because we need to give confidence and say to the ulama, we've got your backs. We've got, the community has got the backs of the ulama. So the ulama speak up. Yeah, we're with you. And they need to hear that confidence. That not that they're putting their heads above the parapet, they're going to be shut down. So we need to help one another. But the most effective way for us to do this at the quickest possible time is to use our masajids and the madrasas to speak about these things, to address it. Because you know, this is not rocket science. Nothing I have said today that you don't know, and nothing I have said today is rocket science that you can't understand. It's simple stuff. But we, and this simple stuff actually does one very important thing is gives us confidence in Islam and that's the crux of the matter you need to be confident and have yaqeen that the revelation you follow is absolutely correct and we need the Muslims to have that confidence uh, the uh, Maghrib Salah inshallah will be about 8 o'clock inshallah um, uh, there's a question uh, from the sister's side at the back uh, I think you got a mic please go ahead Zakallah. Someone within a family or community identifies as gay or lesbian, how should the parents handle the situation? You know, these are tough, these are tough questions, and there's not one answer to, to, to give because each case is going to be different. But what advice I can give is you've got to keep the channel of communication open between the child and the parents, don't break that. Don't break that, because if you break that, they will go off to the gay communities. Right? So you need to keep that channel open of communication, and you need to help that child. Now, we know for a fact nobody's born gay, because Allah says in the Quran and through the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that every child is born on the fitrah. He's pure. She's pure. They're clean. It's the environment that shapes them. Now, it can be very simple as you picking up an idea and changing your mindset or it can be deeply ingrained which is very difficult to identify right so it's not easy to say but the point is somebody's become gay because of the effect of the environment that's had on that person if somebody was born gay that means if two twins were born both of them would be gay but there's over half the cases where twins are born they're not both gay so it's to do with the environment and up till 1973 it was always considered as a mental illness so incest, pedophilia, and all these other deviancies are considered mental illness, but they've taken homosexuality out of that. The point is, you need to be able to discuss with the child. And the point is this, just because you want to do some, I didn't go on the detail on this, but the ayah of the Quran says in Surah Baqarah, just because you desire something, you like something, it doesn't make it right. Like me as a human being, I'm a man. Allah put it within my fitrah to feel attracted to the woman. That's normal, but I don't act on it. 
I might, when I'm fasting in Ramadan, my, my, my fitra, my organic needs, my hunger is telling me to eat. My nature is telling me to eat. The only thing stopping me is my iman and my aql telling me don't. Allah said don't eat, don't eat. So the point is, if you have a desire to do something, you have the ability to stop yourself. Just because you desire something doesn't make it right. So just because you desire something doesn't make it right. So if a gay person has a desire to the same gender, it's natural for a person to be attracted to the opposite gender. Doesn't make it legitimate to have extra to relationship, to have girlfriend, boyfriend. So you need to explain to them and make them understand just because you incline towards something, it's a test for you. It's a test for you. Let's say somebody's poor, he's not able to get married, but he has a strong desire to get married. He has to control himself, he has to fast. It doesn't make it around, uh, allowed for him to have a girlfriend. In the same way, if somebody has a desire for the same gender, they need to regulate themselves. But this you need to through, have through discussion and debate and give them understanding. But please, if in your families you have somebody who is afflicted with this, don't demonize them, don't hate them, and don't cut your channel with them because they, you will lose them. You need to do the best thing to bring them closer to you and to your Rabb. So please keep that in mind. Don't try and be harsh. Yeah, Try and use hikmah. And try and help them. You need to help them. Because you're your children. And you want to be with them in Jannah. You want to be with your family. With your parents. And your progeny in Jannah. So do with them what is best. To keep them on the right path. I think there's another question from the sister's side. Go ahead sister. Uh, yeah. What's the suitable age for parents to discuss the issue of LGBT with their kids? So I think the question was, what is a suitable age to discuss the LGBT issue with their children? You know, as in Islam in other maybe ways as well, there's things which are age appropriate. Just because something is right or something is part of Islam, it doesn't mean you need to tell everybody from day one. Like for example, the fiqh of nikah, the relationship between husband and wife. You're not going to teach that to a five-year-old, even though it's in the Quran and Sunnah. Because there's an issue of maturity. So you need to discuss this with them when they're mature. However, the principles you can teach when they're much younger about desires, just because you want to do something doesn't make it right. About pairs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created all things in pairs. So you can teach them that in animals, male, female, when Nuh alayhi salam, when the flood came, Nuh alayhi salam took a pair of all the animals in the ship. Why? You can discuss that with the children. Why? Because it was mummy and daddy so they can have more families. They can have children. So you can teach them the concept of pairs and complementary. That the male and the female are complementary to one another. And you see that in other aspects of nature with electricity you have a plus and a minus. With a magnet you have a plus and a minus. You know there's complementary things that you have in nature. And same with the human being, it's complementary, male and a female. So you can, without going into the details and the mechanics, which they can understand at an a, a, a older age, you can teach them these basic things at a younger age about pairs. Allah created things in pairs because each person is not complete without the other. And Nuh alayhi salam took a male and a female into the boat, into the ark, so that they could replenish the population of the animals after the flood. So these are the kinds of examples you might be able to give the kids, inshallah. Zakullah Her. Mashallah, there's a written question. There's a written question which I'm. This is not. This is not. Okay, there's a written question uh, from the sister's side. I'm just going to try and read it. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I was uh, gobsmacked when I heard um, Islam school are accepting LGBT issue and spread munkar to our children. Where are. Uh, where are, are we taken refugee? Not sure why. Uh, homeschool is the only option. And second question is, if the Islam school refuse to teach what is going to happen, the munkar is worse than nothing. You see, this is a, I've had this discussion with ulama as well. Um, 
concerned about legislation. I've said to him, I said, look, forget the legislation. The legislation is not here now, but they're still teaching it now. So even if you stop the legislation, this thing's not going to go away. And I said to them that um, even if the legislation is not here, they are using Ofsted to force the schools to teach this stuff. Because you are, Ofsted will measure you on whether you're teaching this stuff. And they say this stuff is part of British values. And if you, if you don't teach this, you're not teaching British values and you will get marked down. Right? Now the thing is, the Jewish schools, you know, I read this in an article, I was quite surprised. The Jewish schools in London, they see it as an honor to get low Ofsted rating. They, you know, joke with one another and say, we've got the lowest rating, alhamdulillah. Well, they don't say alhamdulillah. <laughs> but because they say, we don't compromise. We will teach them what our religion teaches them. He goes, if Ofsted gives us a low marking, that means we're doing good. So, you know, the thing is, as Muslims, we should realize, okay, you know what, we should be concerned about what the schools are teaching. We shouldn't be concerned about Ofsted rating. Like, I was speaking to one of the Maulanas, they run uh, Dar Ulum in Blackburn. And uh, he said to me, he goes, Maza, you know, you're absolutely right. Ofsted inspectors came to the Dar Ulum. And before they came, we briefed the kids that, oh, we believe LGBT is wrong, but it's allowed for other children to do it because it's their belief and their, you know. And we thought, we prepped them up. So the Ofsted will be okay with that. Right? We just briefed them all up. Ofsted inspector came, asked the kids, uh, what do you think about LGBT? They said, oh, we think it's wrong, but other people can do it. It's their religion. He goes, Ofsted marked us down. He goes, they still marked us down because they said, no, you have to believe that it's okay for you as well. Ofsted said that even the Muslim Dar Uloons and the Islam Muslim schools, you have to believe that LGBT is not a sin. If you want to be gay, it's okay for you as well. So there is a problem. So we need to, you know, speak to our teachers. And honestly, this is an important point as parents. You need to have a close relationship with your schools to find out what they're teaching. Because some of the stuff they do, they'll do it quietly because they're worried about what parents will say. And that's why I take my hat off and I'm proud of the, of the parents in, in, in Birmingham. You know, the governors fail them. Maybe the, some of the madrasas fail them and the masajid fail them. The community leaders fail them. The politicians fail them. The councillors fail them. But the parents stood strong and the school stopped teaching that stuff. The school stop. So you don't realize that even yourselves have got ability to make some change. So go to the schools and if they're teaching this stuff, they said, I'm sorry, the law doesn't mandate for you to teach them this stuff and we don't want it to be taught. It's not the job of the government to bring my children up. It's not the job of the government to bring my children up. It's my job as a parent to give the values I believe which are right to my children. If you can homeschool, by all means. And I had just had a discussion with a friend now before I came here. And I said to him, look, go to your madrasa, go to your masjid and see how you as a community can help one another to set up homeschooling. Maybe there are some people who are, you know, able to assist. I mean, I homeschooled my son for a little while. My wife did. You can teach. What they teach your child in a day in school, you can teach in about two or three hours at home. You can cover the material in two or three hours. Then the rest of the day you can spend teaching them other stuff or give them other kinds of tarbiyah or... Uh, skills so you know you might want to look into that but remember also that more and more parents are homeschooling and the government will look at that as well later on so the point is the madrasas the masajids are in our control and we need to use these institutions to address these issues to protect the community so i think it's uh, eight o'clock so it's maghrib time inshallah so uh, can i just say jazakallah to brother mazhar for the enlightening talk inshallah may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you tremendous reward uh, can i also say jazakallah to a few other uh, groups as well so all community leaders and members jazakallah for not only coming here yourselves but also actively promoting this event um, to all of you for making the time uh, and effort to come and listen attentively uh, to um, Sheikh Ismail for allowing the use of Al Bayan Institute uh, and also Jazakallah to Brother Miss for, for, uh, from Jaipur for providing the tea. Um, Brother Mazhar, can I just ask you to do a small dua, please, inshallah, before we finish? Just to tell you, the uh, uh, brother's prayer is going to be on this side and the sister's already got a space on that side for the prayer, inshallah. So after the dua, we will pray. Yeah, so brother's side, we're going to have to move the chairs to one side before we can pray, inshallah, but that shouldn't be a problem.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد اذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمه انك انت الوهاب ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد اذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمه انك انت الوهاب اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر ان الانسان لفي خسر الا الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر Thank <laughs> you.